Yeah. We'll give everybody a moment to start signing in. Okay. Minor technical difficulties, don't worry. All right, welcome everyone to preview week for Willamette, the Pinot Noir auction. The wines featured in this tasting series are small lot bottlings for our exclusive trade auction. Contact Emily at the WVWA and I'll leave her address in the chat if you don't know about the auction and you'd like to learn more. For this year's auction, we're pleased to announce a charitable partnership with the James Beard Foundation's Food and Beverage Investment Fund for Black and Indigenous Americans as a part of their Open for Good campaign. All funds raised on auction lots beyond the opening bids as well as through the Paddle Raise Pledge, will go to the Investment Fund, and I'll drop their website in the chat as well. I wanna take a moment to thank our auction sponsors for their ongoing support. And now I'd like to introduce today's featured panelists. Representing lot 32, Morgan Beck of Johan Vineyards. Representing lot 33, Alfredo Apolloni, Apolloni Vineyards. Uh, Joe Ibrahim of Willamette Valley Vineyards could not be with us. We're hoping he is able to join us later. Shane Moore of Grand Moraine will be representing lot 35 and representing lot Joe. 37. Joe Wright of Left Coast Estate. And there's Joe Ibrahim. Great hey, Joe. You. I'm glad you could be with us, Joe. Hey, Joe. All right. And now I'd like to kick it off to our host, Jessica Ensworth of Northwest Wine Company. Jessica, they're all yours. Hello, hey friends and family. Welcome to the fifth annual Willamette Pinot Noir Auction, uh, live from Oregon. Um, and normally, and you, a lot of you guys have been tuning into this, we would normally have be holding this the first weekend of April, and we have moved um, our team and our group uh, to an online version. We couldn't be more excited to be with you. And uh, so this is an interesting group of people because we've got probably what's unique about this is that we have this giant spread out group um, from all over the Willamette Valley. This is probably the most spread out ge uh, geographically speaking. So we're gonna be speaking a little bit to that. Um, we're gonna go in lot order. So these will be recorded over time and so that they can be revisited if you miss one. Um, and we're so excited. We've got to, we're gonna start off with lot number 32, our winemaker Morgan Beck from Johan Vineyards, the Black Swan. This is a five case lot from the Van Duzer Corridor. Morgan, would you take it away and talk about your lot, please? Sure. Um, yeah, so um, our lot is an isolation of three barrels of Swan Pinot Noir. So we have two blocks on our property planted to the Joseph Swan selection, a selection that originally comes from a vineyard down in Russian River Valley. Um, the clusters were selected specifically um, to kind of highlight uh, different size berries and it, they're really, really small and compact clusters. Um, kind of terrible in terms of <laughs> economics of a vineyard. It sets, you know, between one and 1 1.5 tons per acre each year. Very little fruit on each vine, um, but always makes absolutely stunning wines. And we most often um, select these barrels and put them into our two reserve SKUs. And this year we were able to um, choose three of our favorite barrels and pull off a nice little five case lot blend for this, um, for this auction. And I guess we, we decided to call it Black Swan. Um, I didn't really know much about the Black Swan theory, but um, the Black Swan theory is kind of refers to a hard to predict or rare event that's beyond the realm of normal expectations. And for us, this metaphor kind of um, had association to like the fragility of a system of thought. So I think it's really important for us as winemakers each year to go into each vintage with no expectations and just remind ourselves that maybe that favorite block that's always the best performing might not be the best and there might be something else 
um, that stands out, you know, that can be applied to so many different things that come across our plates during harvest. But, um, you know, the swan thing and the black swan theory seem to fit very well for this, for this wine. So um, that's a bit about our lot. Should I talk about the yeah. tasting the lot? <laughs> Absolutely. Actually, I had a question for you too, Morgan. So you yeah. had mentioned that the yield for this is pretty low, you know, one, between one and one and a half. And this is, a, these are the mainly the swan clones. Um, and for those that aren't that familiar with that, is that, is that acre or that tonnage, is that typical for, for where you are? Or is it typical, can you talk a little bit about that clone and what that does? I don't think it's widely planted. Guys, is it widely planted? Swan clone? Not, Not so much. Not so much. So can you talk a little bit about that and then how it relates in the glass on this particular wine and the flavor profile that you were able to derive from it? Absolutely. So yeah, the the yield is, is quite low and um, lower yields generally lead to higher concentration of both fruit. Um, and in this case, we definitely had some really nice cannons, but they were really evolved. Um, 2018 was a vintage that we had um, a lot of freedom to hang on the vine and develop some nice rife flavors without having much impact of heat spikes or impending weather during harvest to really push us into picking anything that wasn't quite ready. Um, it also was a vintage full of natural acidity, so that was also really nice. Um, but these these tiny clusters, um, that are just packed with flavor. Um, they they have different size berries, so you have um, a lot of different kind of components going into one one blend with just one clone, um, and that translates in the glass. I think to having really nice acid, um, nice balance <laughs> from the size berries, as well as um, nice kind of structured wine but also I think across the board the 2018s have evolved nicely already and the tannins have have smoothed themselves a bit so they're not I mean a lot of us and I'm sure all the other winemakers here today will talk about um, nice structure from 2018 but I'm also really impressed what I'm seeing in my glass right now is um, a really um, kind of you know, uh, cohesive wine at this point. So it's, it'll be fun to see where it goes in the coming year, but it's, it's tasting really nice right now. Excellent. Any really dominant, dominant characteristics that you're, that you're try tasting in the glass right now, Morgan? Anything that we were really like pinpointing so you can give a visual? Sure. Yeah. I see, um, there's a lot of floral notes and that's a quality of swan that we see across the board. Um, we, we like to do a lot of whole cluster uh, here at Johan in general, but specifically on the Swan clone. This blend ended up being right around 80% whole cluster, but the stems um, are, they don't stick out. <laughs> that, that sounds like a lot of whole cluster, but it's not green. Um, it, it lends to some spice and some baking spice notes, but um, and then I, cr I think across the board, the, the 2018s have a lot of like darker fruit profiles. So, you know, kind of blackberry, raspberry, like dark bramble uh, fruit. And I see that in this wine a lot as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Morgan. And thank you for that. Um, we're going to move over to our Italian friend, Alfredo Apolloni from Apolloni <laughs> Vineyards. Alfredo, hello. Um, would you please talk about lot number 33, 5K slot, King of the North. Uh, from Willamette Valley. Alfredo. Hey, um, I'm so happy to be with you guys. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. I'm, I'm in the last little remnants of the uh, hurricane, Isaiah, and I think they're chipping up a tree behind me. Um, but, uh, but I can see you guys and you look happy, so, so good. If it's a little too windy, someone will let me know and I'll, I'll pause. Uh, I'm honored to be with you guys today. I'm Alfredo Apolloni with Apolloni Vineyards. Um, I grew up in Italy. We had family vineyard and winery there, and we came to the Willamette Valley just a little over 20 years ago, uh, started planting vines, and it's been, been awesome. We're, we're honored to be part of 
the uh, the valley and 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 that wonderful world of, of wine that uh, that is pretty special in Oregon. Um, so uh, we have for you um, King of the North. This is our new idea of a necker. We're going to put this on every Apollonia bottle. It's the cloak and cape from uh, Game of Thrones. Um, <laughs> Does so it have a fur collar on there, Alfredo? Yeah, we got the, this is the collar. This is this is John <laughs> Snow, buddy. Um, so tongue in cheek, we named it King of the North. Uh, we are maybe the most northern vineyard in the Willamette Valley, and we're very very excited about this wine. It's delicious. Um, you heard a little bit from Morgan about the specialness of 2018. Um, we really felt it was kind of a Goldilocks vintage. Um, remind me a little bit of 08. Maybe there's something in these eight. Um, long, very temperate, uh, ripening right at the harvest time. We were able to hang, and we are the most northern vineyard maybe, so we were able to hang for into late October, uh, so pretty late. Uh, might be one of the latest uh, picks on uh, of the auction lots. Um, but we had great flavor, great concentration, um, a nice liveliness of acid, which I think is really critically important in long life Pinot Noir. Um, Spice and, and some of these qualities that are that are, are pretty pretty unique, I think, to our uh, northern soils. We just got a new AVA the Tualatin Hills. Um, so our laurel wood soils up there in the north um, are giving uh, some really interesting, a little bit binary components. So this this deep fruit, but but liveliness, um, some spicy notes with earth, um, and um, yeah, so this is all triple seven from our Fiorentina vineyard. So that's that's in honor of my mom. Hi, mom. Um, and um, that's planted right over our barrel cave uh, out at the vineyard, um, which is um, right in those deep uh, deep laurel wood soils. So um, super cool lot. Very very excited about it. Um, we did a little bit of all of our favorite winemaking things. Uh, it's got some whole cluster with whole cluster ferment. It was a very small uh, one-ton ferment, um, and um, we were pretty gentle in terms of the wine making the punch down. Um, you know, as these vintages are getting a little bigger, the wind is picking up here. Uh, that we don't have to be as, as aggressive in the wine making. We can make a, a very elegant kind of old world style, um, which uh, you know, it's exciting. It's exciting to see um, uh, out of the valley and. Um, it's a delicious lot. So that's, that's what I have. I noticed that you also used an Italian coopered French oak barrel for this. Is that, does it change anything stylistically with that? Or is there a well, different approach to that kind of cooperage? Well, of course it's made by Italians. So there are a lot of espresso breaks um, during the production. Um, and there's, there's tension in the barrel because, um, you know, um, the wood, <laughs> Uh, the, 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 the French oak, of course, gives a wonderful spice and, 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 and a little bit of a hint of, um, of uh, mocha uh, quality. It's a, it's a medium toast gamba uh, that we like to use, um, and uh, it just it enriches the wine. It, it puts another layer in there, um, but I do like that tension. You know, it, it's got a little bit of minerality or something that, that shows during the wine. Um, and, and I think, again, in long life wines, these are the things that make them exciting, that make them exciting for a long time. It's drinking great right now. I've been. I have. It's hard for me to stop. It's so delicious. But um, but it's gonna. It's gonna be one of these. I think the vintage as a whole is one that's gonna gonna last for a long time and be pretty pretty special. That's great, Alfred. I like Gamba. Always has a little bit of that sweet that sweet cedar thing going on too, which yep. I think is so so sexy and sensual. Um, thank you for that description. I really appreciate that. We are now going to move over to our friend Joe Ibrahim out in Willamette Valley Vineyards. They have <laughs> lot number thirty four. It's a five case lot called the Brno Block Selection. And uh, Joe, take it away. Tell us about your wine, if you would, please. Hi everyone. Um, I'm, uh, our lot is uh, barrel selection from the Brno Block, and uh, Brno Block is—it's uh, called that. It's the first 15 acres that our founder Jim Brno planted in 1983. So quite a bit of uh, age on these vines, and uh, they're grown in this beautiful uh, old-style trellis system, which is called Geneva Double Curtain, which is uh, not from Geneva, Switzerland, but from Geneva, New York, actually. And so the vines grow in these beautiful waterfall pendulous 
uh, fashion where the fruit kind of sets up right along the, the top of the wire. And uh, it's just a, a really unique way of growing grapes. Um, and so all of the grapes that are main estate, if you come up the main drive, you'll see are in this beautiful uh, um, trellis system. And the quality that we get from this block is uh, just really soft, velvety texture, uh, great what I call pinosity, which are just kind of classic pinot characters of spice, cherry spice, uh, leather, cedar box, um, really nice, uh, just secondary elements. Every time you put your nose in the glass, you get something, something different to explore. And so uh, for this barrel selection, uh, we partnered with, essentially it's a craft cooperage. It's a very small, limited production cooperage called Francis Miguel. And they source their wood from uh, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and France. And, uh, you know, when the, when, the, when the barrel guide came to the, to the winery the first time, I usually have a tendency to shoo these guys away. But for some reason, I said, stick around and uh, let's give your barrels a try. And it just matches this wine so perfect and uh, provides this minerality and this gentle toast and this integration that we just don't see anywhere else. So I wanted to showcase that um, for this wine, for the exceptional vintage. Um, it's got this amazing rich depth, dark color to it. I don't know if you can see it on the camera, um, but it's just a beautiful wine from beautiful vintage. Joe, so you, you've got, you know, the Willamette Valley Vineyards has been around since 1983, and, and I know that you got here in 2015. Is there anything that you've tasted out of the cellar as you've tasted back through those vintages that this 2018 is reminiscent of something else, or do you think it's its own animal? You know, I don't, I don't like to compare vintages too much, but it's definitely reminiscent of some of the strong vintages like 2008, kind of, you know, I, I'm tasting 2008 you know what it looks like now but I can kind of try to draw those uh, connections even 2012 there's a lot of that similarity and the viscosity and the weight um, from the wines that came out of 2012 so just one of another top vintage out of Oregon yeah super structured and pretty thank you Joe for that description um I appreciate that. I can't wait to try these wines one of these days if we get if there's any left. Um, and then we're going to move over to our friend Shane Moore at Grand Moraine. Hi, Shane. Hello, Jessica. Hi, Shane. Hi, from hi wine family. <laughs> um, this is lot number 35 from uh, from Grand Moraine, five case lot called Terminal Moraine from Yamhill Carlton AVA. Uh, will you tell us what's special about your wine, Shane, and anything that you did in the vineyard uh, or during the winemaking process? Yeah. Um, well, let's start with Grand Moraine itself, uh, the vineyard. Um, I work with two different vineyards, um, uh, both the state. One's out on kind of the west side of Yamhill Carlton AVA uh, in the foothills of, of the um, uh, coastal range. And the other is kind of, it's, it's pretty near Shea, but it's uh, kind of, I guess stuck in between pretty close to Dundee Hills. Um, it's, it's kind of in, in there. It's, it's a lot different uh, climate over there. A lot more wind, uh, a lot shallower soils there. Um, and this is a, this is a wine that's kind of a blend of the two different vineyards I work with. Um, the, the vineyard around my winery, I make a wine called Dropstone from that's just, uh, it's all about just ageability, big acids, uh, and, and actually quite structured. Um, the other wine that uh, this is kind of based around is a wine I call Cascade, which is from my um, coastal um, vineyard or more coastal range vineyard, which is funny. Uh, but it's a barrel fermented wine. Um, we pop the heads on bariques, about uh, 30 bariques every year. Very time consuming. A lot of smashed fingers and thumbs by interns, um, but it's good for them. They learn how to do a little bit of Cooper work. And uh, then we do some fermentations and that that kind of uh, I do the fermentations on some of my favorite blocks and those that are really really tannic wines uh, and that softens the wine it's a small fermentation so they don't get as hot uh, you're adding a lot of um, a lot of sort of oak tannins early which you think oh you're adding a lot of tannins early what is, does that do that should make a bigger wine well a lot of the time what you're doing is you're adding uh, conjugation points and it's able to um, have those um, tannin anthocyanin complexes elongate faster, softens the wine. So really pretty. Um, 
kind of a barrel uh it's kind of a barrel selection from those two wines two of my favorite wines i call it terminal moraine because i think that's one of my favorite glacial terms um it's where the glacier stops and uh that you know so the terminal moraine is where there was a glacier at one point it's the farthest advancement and maybe there still is but it's the farthest advancement of said glacier just hanging out on subtle lake last week in the central oregon cascades and um subtle lake is a terminal moraine um created lake for those of you who know where subtle lake is uh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> lodge, i think subtle lodge is down that way if i'm not mistaken oh yeah i i had i had a few beers and margaritas there corn dog that's great good so tell me about tell me about this particular wine and tell us about what what's the flavor profile of this wine in the mouth yeah this, i just second. opened it actually this is the first time i've tasted it since we bottled it um so i'm having fun uh it's really red fruit actually this one's really red fruit oriented i got like boysenberry sandalwood um a lot of pomegranate on it um some of the flavors are like that zebra gum that you eat when you're a kid which is really fun um and some black pepper it's got this sort of crispness of tannins and, and fruit that I, I kind of describe as al dente. Uh, I, I figure Alfredo would like that. It's just on that cusp of ripeness, you know. Um, it's, it's just right there. Um, so this is a fun wine. I think it's going to age really well. Uh, both of my vineyards are pretty early site, pretty warm. And, uh, and I pick early. So we were picking this. Uh, I looked at my notes. I think it was... September 15th through the 21st kind of was what these blocks um, we're looking at. So pretty early. Um, I like doing that. What, what about the mouthfeel on this, Shane? I mean, these are like, I think we've talked a lot about the 2018 vintage being very structured and supple and they have this voluptuousness to them and this sort of, you know, this sort of kind of sultry sort of shape. So, but I love that cold crunchy fruit pot as well. So what are we talking about with mouthfeel and what, as well? What can we explain yeah. on Actually, this this wine, I'm not really into with the Grand Marine wines doing a voluptuous style. This wine's crisp, um, and I think that's part of the picking it so early. So I, I wrote actually that it was um, very coiled. Um, it's very tightly wound, almost like really, really coiled up, like a spring ready to pop. Um, so yeah, I, I think you know maybe it's a little bit of an outlier for eighteen. Um, but there's a ton of acid in all all the 18s I've tasted, and, and this one has that as well. It seems like there's an incredible amount of versatility in this vintage, and I think if anything, I think this group having so much um, distance between. I mean, we're really talking about a lot of outliers in the valley, and just in terms of of where they're located, is is pretty exceptional. And that's that is no exception with our friend Joe Wright from Left Coast Cellars. <laughs> Hi, Joe. Hey. Hi. Um, Hi. New lot number 37, also 5K slot ensemble, also out of the Van Duzer Corridor. Yeah. Would you tell us a little bit about your wine, Joe Wright? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. This, uh, this wine, um, well, obviously, you know, it pushes all of us to put, produce something that, that we hadn't before. And just when you think you're you're doing enough and then you get asked to do something above and beyond you really have to think about it and and th and in our in my case um i historically at left the left coast the state kicks out of three different vineyard designates every year and so the thought there and hence the name of the wine ensemble um the definition of that is a, a group of items viewed as a whole rather than individually so i wanted to take these three vineyard designates and and play with blending them together. They're the, all three of them are really obviously distinct and unique from one another. They all come off the left coast estate. Um, we have about 500 acres here on the estate. Um, about 140 of it's planted for vineyards. We've got oh five really different distinct uh, terroirs and microclimates going on within the estate as well. So lots of work with even you know within one fence line, but. Um, about 50% of this wine's made from a vineyard just over uh, this oak savanna behind the computer here uh, called our Truffle Hill Vineyard. Um, I love this strip of land. It sits kind of up on a, a ridge back. It has no real aspect to it, just kind of high and dry, surrounded by oak savanna. We are in the Van Duzer Corridor, and um, the one thing I like about this, this vineyard site is it's because it's 
high, dry, and protected by the oak savannas. It just doesn't get um, uh, knocked out every day by the winds that cruise through this, this vineyard site in general. So resulting in a uh, very um, elegant, perfumed, um, but velvety textured and um, acid driven Pinot Noir. And I really like to capture that in the bottle every year. So that's about, that's 50% of the blend. Another vineyard designate we produce off the estate that's part of this blend. In fact, more or less about 20, 25% of the blend is uh, off our latitude 45 block. And uh, just for fun, it's is that it's right what? there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the latitude forty five block is um, all. Uh, I'm going to back up. Truffle Hills, all Vadensville, by the way. The latitude forty five vineyard is made up of uh, primarily the one Dijon one hundred and fifteen clone and a little bit of triple seven. Um, it's planted on that south facing hillside, fairly exposed but moderately deep soils. Kind of kick out nice. Nice bigger berries, bigger clusters, really spicy, brambly, um, uh, red and blue fruit driven uh, wines. Uh, again, that's about 25% of the blend. And then the balance of it right at the top of the hill there is um, by what we call our right bank. And um, that's all Pomard. Anyway, very exposed, very shallow soils, little or no water holding capacity, um, pretty devigorated canopy, small clusters, small berries, thick skins. Um, that's the power in the wine. It's just they're black driven, uh, black fruit driven wines every year. They're, they're tannic, they're chewy, they're rich and awesome. And um, so yeah, that's the ensemble. In essence, that's what uh, we've chosen to create our uh, auction wine. Awesome, Joe. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about whole cluster in some of these these warmer vintages. And for those of you that are using whole cluster, um, what's the advantage of that? If you were gonna uh, if you were gonna part, you know, relate that to to our 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 guests, how do you relate? What are the advantages of whole cluster, and why would you use them in a warm year versus a cool year? Anybody um, wanna, Joe? Well, yeah, I'll just finish off and and start that conversation at the same time. The uh, so yeah, we did some in 18. I think this year is going to be another great year for it. We just got a lot of clusters with not a lot of weight behind them. So just a lot of exposed rachis that, you know, being exposed tends to lignify or ripen the, the stem. And anyway, you get a lot of spice and just um, other characteristics you wouldn't otherwise out of the fruit. Um, one, as far as just your perception of the wine too, though, um, it just aids in longevity and age worthiness you know you're just a different different type of ripe tannins definitely going to let your wine hang out for the long run awesome thank you joe anybody else want to touch base on that too Can I weigh in whole cluster Not um I'll, I'll jump in Thanks. um yeah we we use a lot of whole cluster here at johan and um for me specifically in warmer vintages, it's, you know, an 18 is a great example of this. We just had that time get just one step further. And you know, like Joe was saying, the, the stems are woody and that wood translates to another kind of dimension in tannin and, and mouthfeel um, specifically when given a little bit of time to age itself out. Um, I also have seen in particularly warmer vintages, I've been doing some whole cluster trials recently and see that the alcohol conversions on higher level of whole cluster is lower. So I'll do like a zero, you know, a hundred percent distemmed, a 25%, 50, 75, and nearly a hundred. And I'll see the lowest alcohol conversion on the highest percentage of whole cluster, um, which is really nice, especially if you know, your sugars may have gotten a little bit higher than you want, but the flavors are really nice. Um, I think cold cluster is a great tool for us to be able to kind of bring balance back without having to do any other alter alterations in the wine's chemistry. That's a really good point, Morgan. I think that, uh, yeah, in essence, the stems sponge up alcohol. I think, who's, who, has anyone ever like put a bunch of stems after a whole cluster fermentation in a blender? 
diluted it and measured alcohol. I've always wanted to do that. We should I want to do that now. You should do that, Joe. I want to quantify how much alcohol is absorbed by each stem. <laughs> See, the innovation is constant, guys. There's constant sharing. There's constant sharing of ideas in the Willamette Valley. We're that is a hallmark of this of this area. It's like all these, you know, crazy brains all getting together. And and I think this is a, one of the foundational things about our region is a, a innate curiosity for science and and then drinking and eating, which we do so well. Um, do we have some questions, Julia, from from our our uh, our guests? Yeah, I had a I had a good one from registration, and folks, uh, feel free to drop questions in the Q and A or the chat. Um, we are we will certainly take them. But um, from registration, so this is a very technically minded group. I've got all winemakers here, and I think this is a good one for this group. Um, taking climate, soil, and the hand of the winemaker, which is the most important. In, you can speak to your site, you can speak to Willamette Valley, but which of those three is the most influential Influential, and why? Uh, why don't we start with Alfredo? Okay, wow. Is that okay? Um, of course, with pleasure. Um, I would love to say the winemaker, but I personally think climate is the most important, um, followed by soil and the winemaker. I mean, you know, we all talk about the wine is the grapes and what, what you put in, you, you know, is so important to, to, to what makes the wine. And we can tweak the climate, you know, uh, Joe was talking about Geneva double curtain. I mean, that's kind of like an interesting uh, trellising system that, that affects how the grapes are, how warm or cool they are, how much sun they get. Um, but uh, uh, being up north, uh, our wines are definitely different. It's quite a bit cooler. We, we, even though we pick later to, to get that last little bit of, uh, of physiological maturity. Um, even in a big vintage like 2018, our wines are lighter. Uh, they're, they're, that's the nature of them. Uh, and and uh, I could, you know, just macerate them to death and they would still be lighter, they're, you know. But, um, but that's what's special about these wines from the Valley. They're, they're unique, they're super interesting. Um, the climate uh, varies in these little microclimate areas. That's my opinion. Okay, let's hear the rebuttal. Well, that's, and that's, you're the most northern, so let's go to Joe I and, and talk about one that's more than the most southern. So let's, let's talk about that, Joe, if you don't mind taking that away. Joe I from Willamette Valley Vineyards. Yeah, yeah sure. I, I, I would also say climate, uh, specifically in Oregon. I mean, I made wine in California and, you know, the climate can give you things that you can then work with as a winemaker to manipulate from there. But in Oregon, Sometimes the, the season doesn't, doesn't provide you the tools to get your wines to where you might want it to be. So for example, if it's a, a cooler vintage and you know there's rain at harvest and the wines just tend to be a little bit leaner and lighter, um, you know, it's gonna be a hard time to push color and push tannin and uh, push those wines to be kind of rich and opulent and uh, ripe like in a warm year. So uh, for sure climate first in Oregon, I would say. Um, but the, the winemaker can certainly manipulate a lot, but you, you try to be true to the vintage as best as you can. True. And, uh, and, and I would say Pinot Noir, unlike any other grape, takes on the site where it's grown. Uh, you know, if Morgan and I were neighbors and we had the same clone planted in the same year in the same soil, you know, just because the light shined just a little bit different on her grapes and the wind blew just slightly different, uh, a different time of day, we'd come to the harvest at the end of the year and we'd taste our wines and we'd say, you know, they taste just a little bit different. I love it. Even if they did everything the same. I love it. I think, Morgan, let's, let's throw that to you too, that question to you. Yeah, I would, I would fully agree with climate um, for sure. And I think the same in terms of here specifically in Oregon, each vintage is so different. And even within the valley, we have um, so many different microclimates across across the entire Willamette Valley. And specifically on this call today, we're all mm -hmm. um, kind of in different little pockets that even within, for example, the 2018 vintage, I'm sure my wine tastes completely different than, you know, um, Alfredo up north or Joe down south. But um, it is kind of interesting too, uh, Joe, <laughs> from left coast and I share a driveway. So our properties are actually really close to each other. 
And it's always fun because I think that um, we make very different wines, even though the sites are, are really close and our soils are probably pretty close. Um, yes, there are variations throughout the vineyards, but um, that's a really cool part of winemaking too, is that the winemaker's hand or, you know, just the decisions that we make from picking to um, different, you know, fermentation protocols and when we choose to press and what we choose to age in, when we choose to bottle and um, all of those kind of really, they really have a big impact too. So I would say climate, soil, absolutely for sure, but winemaker touch in hand is is pretty, pretty high up there as well. So. Um, I'm going to go to Shane next and Shane, uh, will you touch base on that where you are? Cause you're, you're pretty west as well. Yeah. You know, I, I, I get asked this question a lot and I, I kind of think of it as like, what's the shape of a two-sided triangle? I mean, it doesn't exist. Right. And, and you can't have soil without climate. So there you are. Um, but that's like, I, I think this, this one, this question is so like, the antithesis of everything that I think about wine personally, um, because, um, because I'm all, I'm philosophically, I think we need to look at wine as a whole and as a thing and, and as something that is, is what it is in and of itself. And we need to not be distracted by the little minutia, um, of, of things like, like that. I think, I think we're, I think we've been a little bit, um, I guess jaded, not jaded maybe, but uh, I think the Saw movies just really messed us up in, in this idea of, of taking apart a wine and putting it into its little tiny pieces. Let's, let's just look at the wine, man. <laughs> That's my opinion. Well, and I think, I think there's definitely, you know, each, each site is so specific and it, you know, it's just like any, it, it has its own characteristic and personality. And the reason I wanted to finish this question with Joe Wright is, you know, as a hydrologist, you have a, you know, hydrology uh, focus in your educational background. Um, you can you kind of speak to that a little bit van duzer is really wind affected typically and so how does that affect with you know what kind of where why did you land there at, at left coast with that and does does the hydrology these kind of drier years how does that affect what you've seen out there in the same vein of this question gotcha well and well, you know, it's kind of coupled with the fact that it doesn't, you know, we, you know, our soils as well, these sedimentary soils are, are just, just kind of really sand, silt, and clay, you know, and not a lot of topsoil. So above and, you know, above and beyond the, the winds, I mean, we, you know, it, it takes a lot of time to establish vineyards, um, even with water. Um, and it takes a lot of time to just sort of lay off that water, you know, and it, 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 in this case, I'm working on, on vineyards that don't, we're, we're just starting to taper after like eight, nine and 10 years, you know, it takes a while to get them going. Mm -hmm. um, the question about, you know, what has the biggest play or role in wine quality or style rather, um, I've always been, you know, certainly maybe just equally a soil and, and climate guy. Um, I think in general, generally speaking, you know, all, everyone's making wine the same way all over the world. And what distinguishes us from our neighbors, Morgan, just on the other side of the hill or, or Joe, you down south, um, is our, our, our soil and our microclimate. I mean, that's what makes us different in the winery. Personally, every year I just do less and less and less. That's more and more and more in my case. Um, the uh, you know in the winery, it's 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 grow your grapes and and just understand yeast and keep them happy and cozy and warm, and you're gonna make good wine. And it's gonna be really expressive of the site and the vintage, especially being here in Oregon as they everyone varies. I'm going on. 23 or four years now and not one's been like another there's some similarities but man they have all been different and that's why i dig it so much out here awesome you guys that's that was that's a, that was very nicely done um julia do we have another question that you would like to throw to our panelists yeah you know if it's all right with everybody i've got one um so with uh 
I think, you know, in the last few years that I've been here, I think the biggest cliche that I think every winemaker is tired of is the comparison to Burgundy. Um, so my question for all of you is, Burgundy aside, is there a different region that you take inspiration from or in some way um, it makes you, the, the Willamette Valley reminds you of it or um, if even just like maybe a specific producer, um, but somewhere else in the world where you take some sort of inspiration or find some sort of kinship in your winemaking? Definitely Piedmont. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I think just the, the, the difficulty of the grapes that we're growing, the challenge in the, that Pinot Noir is a difficult grape uh, and it's not very adaptable to a lot of different places. Um, the rolling hillsides and the hazelnuts give a very similar sort of appearance, but of course the varietals and the wines we're making are completely pretty different. Um, and, and, you know, Oregon wines are unique and that's what's so awesome about them. Um, and, and Pinot Noir is super expressive of where it's coming from. Awesome. Morgan, how about you? Um, that's a good question. I, I guess I would answer, um, we, we are experimenting with a lot of different grape varieties here at Johan. Um, we have 16 different varieties in the ground at this point, and we have been kind of driven and focused to look at some of the Austrian varieties recently. And I just had the opportunity to visit Austria um, last summer and kind of talk with winemakers working with these grapes that have been working with them for a long time. And, um, you know, some do have Pinot Noir in a few of the different regions, but I saw a lot of similarities and expression of um, both Pinot Noir and say Blaufrankisch or, or Zweigelt. Um, and yeah, I would, I would say that that is a region that I'm looking towards and speaking to producers just to talk more about tannin management as we do get a little bit warmer. Some of the, the growing growing regions there are warmer. Um, and I've been really enjoying some of the wines from there. So, yeah. Are you toying around with like a little Gruner Veltliner and Chamberson and things like that as well? I mean, is that? Yeah, we have some Gruner in the ground. We have just under two acres of Gruner, about two acres of Blaufrankisch, and then an acre of Zweigelt and an acre of St. Laurent at this point. So yeah, it's been really fun to see those. And then we're also doing some blends and including Pinot Noir in that blend, um, which is you know typical of some of the blends that you see coming out of the different regions in Austria as well, so. Sounds really exciting. How about yeah. Joe? I you've got you've got really established vineyard sites there. Are you guys toying around with other varieties or different recipes or kind of what, what are you guys thinking about in your conversations for the future? Um, I mean, certainly we've we've got our hands on a lot of different varieties, making wine from uh, all the various microclimates, from the Rogue to Walla Walla. Uh, Umpqua Valley, you know, you name it, we, we've got it here in our cellar. And that's a really exciting thing about making wine here. Um, our mission statement is to tell the Oregon story through wine. And so, you know, Oregon being one of the largest states in the union has all these microclimates and we can tell an awesome story uh, with all of them. Um, so, I mean, we've got a ton of varieties and I, I'm not gonna name them all to you, um, but we most recently just started our first plantation of uh, Pinot Meunier which is the first one for us. And that's really focused on our sparkling wine production, which is um, a big project for us right now. Um, so that's exciting. And as far as drawing inspiration from other areas, for me personally, I, I tend not to do that. I'd like to see what's in front of me and uh, kind of drive, drive our own ship here. Um, but there's certainly, you know, tons of inspiration from people on the screen and within the state and other Oregon producers just doing fantastic things. Mm -hmm. And how about Joe Wright? I mean, if, if Morgan's playing with those things and you guys are really, really close together, is that something that you're also looking into or are you staying in court? Sorry, Jessica, once more. Oh, I said, you, since you and Morgan are so close together in your, um, in your region and are you also experimenting with some other varieties or are you guys staying the course um, in, in Pinot Noir or are you playing? 
Yeah, no, not planes so much, quite frankly. Um, not not that I don't want to. I mean, I, I dig that for sure. It's cool, but but um, I don't know. I I, I like uh, I like just kind of being the classic guy, you know. I you know just playing around with all that. I I've seen things come and go over the last two dozen years so many times. Um, but the things that have strayed strong and the things that keep me thinking constantly are the classics. And the Chardonnay, especially Juliet's here. Question as far as regions, though, you know, I was thinking about that, and I, and I think it really has, has to do with an individual site. Um, any site with some type of extreme, all go, growing, uh, all wine growing regions have them. Um, sites to force the uh, force to walk the line of success and failure, at least half the time, are the most intriguing to me always. So it's just like it. California, France, New Zealand, Australia, Cal you know, Oregon. It's just like those those high elevations, those north bases, those shallow soils. Like, you know, it doesn't always work, but man, when it does, it's it's the best. Thank you, Joe. And Shane, you really have a lot of you've got a lot of different vineyards in a lot of different places. What's your what's your approach? And is there any place to answer Julia's question that you're really excited about that you taking some from? yeah um yeah so you know i only work with chardonnay and pinot and and there's a reason i live in the willamette and i plan on making pinot for the rest of my life i, I think i i can't do anything else now i've been totally ruined with everything else um i'd love to make some blau though or, or some gamay i mean someday that would be super fun too um you know i've worked all over the world uh traveled a lot uh i think you know, in, in terms of like relationships with Oregon and other places, I was in Alsace recently and it looks very geographically similar, you know, it's like, wow, this looks a lot like Oregon. But um, I think in terms of culture, uh, I think we have a lot uh, to share with um, Margaret River in many ways. We're, uh, and that's in Western Australia. Uh, not, not so much in terms of like wine, but um, culture of people. Uh, you know, both regions are about 50 years old in terms of winemaking. Uh, a lot of young people, a lot of uh, bootstraps sort of things going on. Um, a lot of um, camaraderie in both places and just a lot of fun to live in both places. So I find, I find a lot of inspiration from there. I know my Chardonnay, I've totally been inspired by Margaret River. And um, yeah, I, I, I love it there. If I could live anywhere else, probably be there. That's wonderful. We've got a, a question from the audience that says, what produces higher tannin levels, warm or cold weather? Ooh. Shane, do you want to start that one off? Yeah, um, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think it depends on, on what you're looking at, right? Uh, so if you're letting a, so, uh, some fruit, Pinot particularly, let's talk about Pinot, uh, get super ripe, you're getting a lot of skin tannin. And, um, and that can be a really big wine, but uh, if it's a cooler climate or if it's a cooler year with a lot of seeds, you're getting a lot of seed tannin, um, which can be more astringent. Uh, so, I mean, both, both. That's the fun. <laughs> that's the fun answer. Yeah, I think it's the you know your perception of either or is going to be totally different. You know, your green tannins versus ripe tannins. They, they can both be screaming, but yeah, it just depends on if it's a cooler or warm year. Yeah. Yeah, I remember being in a wine class at one point where they said, you know, tannin, big tannins are a warm weather thing, light tannins are a cold weather thing, and I'm just like, I, you know, I feel like there's a region that Alfredo just mentioned that uh, is pretty cool and has a pretty tannic grape. <laughs> I think we maybe have one time for one more question. Julia, do we have any? Yeah, let me see. We just, looks like we just got one in the Q&A a second ago. Uh, what do you guys like to drink when you're not drinking your own wine? Great question. Start it off, guys. Cool opportunity. I drink anything. Yeah. I <laughs> yeah. mean, wine is delicious, and we, we love it. Um, but every night, once in a while, you need a little break from from uh, from the Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir being our, our you know delicious and and really pretty easy to drink. You know, in big range. Um, but um, I, I do secretly uh, enjoy a little bit of nothing that ever comes of it. Morgan, how about you? What are you drinking right now? What are you drinking that outside of your own wines? 
Um, well, it's been really hot here in Oregon. So um, cool, crisp whites. Been enjoying, I had a really nice albarino the other night. Um, and then, you know, on warm summer evenings, I love like light bodied peppery reds. So there's a, a bunch of great examples from Northern Italy. Um, and then Austria as well. I've been digging some crisp gruners and just kind of easy drinking Zweigelts and um, yeah, just the lighter bodied reds and high acid whites for warm weather for sure. Me too. How about Joe I? What are you drinking right now, Joe? Uh, my wife and I are definitely drinking a lot of rosé, a lot of Pinot Gris right now. Um, I tend to be pretty cheap, so I, I like to drink my own wine. <laughs> uh, but certainly, if anybody has anything to share, you know, I'm all over it. How about how about our other Joe? What are you drinking right now, Joe? Gin and tonics. <laughs> there we go. Actually, <laughs> actually, no. That last night I prepared a uh, a white Negroni, so equal parts Plymouth gin. Um, Lille Blanc and Suze. It's uh, like a gentian root liqueur. Really good. We'll try that one out. We'll share that. We'll have to share that recipe. <laughs> how, do you, how do you spell Suze, Joe? S U Z. I think S U Z E. Okay. Yeah. It's a Swiss liqueur. It's delicious. It's pretty so intense. Good. So Very good. Very rooty. How about you, Shane? I mean, in the last week, margaritas, Heater Allen Pilsner, um, several Chardonnays from the Mekong. Um, what else have I been drinking? Uh, lots of rosé. Yeah, lots of rosé. My wife works in a winery, too, so I don't have to only drink my own wine for if I want to be cheap. So that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I loved also, I asked some responses on what everybody's pairing with your, with their wines this year. Like, what would you pair these wines with? And I love the responses. Shane, Shane was lamb chops. Joe uh, Ibrahim was pizza with fennel sausage, which I thought was brilliant. Brilliant. Um, Joe W. Tacos. Any kind of taco. I love that. Um, Alfredo grilled duck breast, although you are dabbling into the vegan end of it, which I thought was wonderful. And Morgan, what would you, what are you going to pay bear in your wines with right now? This wine. Um, I don't, tasting this wine today and similar to Shane, this was the first time I've tasted it since we bottled it. Mm -hmm. It got me really excited about Thanksgiving, which I know there's a lot to do in between now and Thanksgiving for us, but Thanksgiving is always a really great celebration um kind of the end of harvest and then just a smorgasbord of all of the things on the table i'm i'm kind of ready for those like more rustic and hearty dishes so yeah thanksgiving table for for this wine for sure does that happen a lot with you guys where you're you're able to just kind of are you surprised a lot of times when you're tasting a wine out of the gate and it and you reopen it um, what, I mean, what is that like is from somebody who, from crafting it from, from its raw material to having it come along, you know, where, where it is right now today, where you're tasting out of the bottle, it's relatively kind of young, probably early for, for where you would sometimes release. And then how do you, how are you able to see the longevity of where that wine is going to go? Um, now that you've had a chance to do it with this wine, could you give a couple of, of words about what you think about? where this one is today, where it's going, and what was really surprising to you about what's come out in, in this particular line that would be helpful to our to our participants today? Sure. Shane, would you want to start with us? Or Morgan, Morgan, go ahead and start. Um, yeah, I would just say, you know, across the board, we're talking about a lot of structure um, from the 2018s, but lots of natural acidity. And I think tannin and acid are the two kind of main components for ageability in a wine. Um, remembering back to blending and putting this wine to bottle, there were quite a bit of um, kind of not aggressive tannins, but the tannins were um, much, much rougher <laughs> at the time. And even within just the year that this has been almost a year, I guess, in bottle, it's um, it's really evolved, and the acid is kind of 
integrating into the wine. I mean, I kind of think about like when we blend and when we put wines to bottle, um, it's, it's like a star, you know, the, the fruits out here and the acids out here and the, you know, the tannins are, and, and over time that comes together in kind of a more of a circle. Um, and yeah, we're getting there, but all of those, uh, great, you know, qualities that equip a wine to age are definitely present in the 2018s across the board. And, and I'm, I'm seeing that here in this wine. It's, Love it's that. nice to drink now. So it, it will be nice for years to come, I think. That's, I love that description, Morgan. How about, Shane, how about you? Do you want to weigh in on that? What, what, what your impressions have been and, and uh, were, anything surprising that came out that you weren't expecting? Um, yeah, you know, I, I kind of echo Morgan. Like uh, something I've been, in, I've been noticing lately more and more is this, uh, that, you know, I put the wines to bottle and I think, oh, they're, they're drinking great. And then, you know, five years later, they're drinking great, but they're, they're softer than what I wanted them to be maybe in five years. Like they're, they're just, you know, so I've been trying to I, go from whenever I'm bottling to be, you know, whenever I, I used to go to bottle, I used to think, oh, I want the wine to have the texture that I want it to have. And now I think often in the last few years, it's been more of that sort of thing what Morgan describes is that. Oh, I'm I'm gonna take the tannin a little bit too far for right now because I know a bit too far right now. And it's almost like you over exaggerate some things. So that it comes back kind of together over in the bottling process and the aging so process. Knowing that um in a in <laughs> I think <laughs> I don't know if I answered the question, but <laughs> Oh I think you did great. I think you did great. Um how about uh, Joe I? What would you think about? What do you think? What What are your impressions after you're tasting your wine after having it been in bottle for such for a while, long time? Um, so recently, uh, so my team puts together a tasting um, surprise tasting every week, and we recently uh, they snuck in a 2018 vintage wine, and it was blind, and I tasted it, and I said, "Ooh, this isn't ours." I thought it was a different producer. And uh, its bottled bouquet was just uh, so unique and so different than what I've been used to. And I think that's one of the things that I love about tasting our wines uh, again after we bottle it is how they blossomed in the bottle. Um, you know, the 2018s and this wine in particular, you know, I'm tasting it today and it just has such youthfulness. And I just, I'm excited to see how it's going to go. Um, but this wine, I mean, it's got a lot of energy. It's going gonna, it's gonna to last quite a few years. Um, we really don't try to manipulate, you know, tannins going into the bottle. We just kind of let them be what they want to be. And, uh, you know, I'm always surprised. Uh, Alfredo, would you like to touch base? Thank you, Joe. That was a great answer. I love that. Alfredo, would you like to touch base on your wine? I, I'm, I'm kind of um, inspired by the comments of others. They, they were awesome. And I was actually, like Morgan, I was thinking a lot about Thanksgiving in a glass with this particular Pinot Noir, it's um, it's got a little bit of um, uh, culinary herb, uh, just a little hint of it, and then this really explosive uh, red curranty fruit, um, which kind of reminds me of the cranberry sauce. So uh, I may be, you know, thinking turkey. Um, so and it's exciting, and I like her perfect sweet spear thing. Uh, you know, we start with these kind of edgy wines, and then they come together. I just loved it. Super cool. Thank you, guys. It's a great, it's a, that was a great description. And uh, Joe Wright, how about you? Um, yeah, I, I, like everybody else, just opened the bottle, that, what, an hour ago. Um, it reminds me a lot like the blend I initially put together, you know, and then, you know, we bottled it and it kind of dumbed down and it's really expressive again. Um, I'm really happy with it. It's just so rare that yet you can get a vintage that has so much power yet balance of acidity that goes the long haul you know and i think this is one um yeah ditto morgan i mean it's got the, just the ripe tannins it's got the acidity you know the chemistry's there i know the wine intimately it was very well grown and taken care of it's gonna go the distance uh, and it seems to be the theme of of this is that these are going to be wines that are wonderful out of the gate and, and at the same time have the ability to go the distance and we uh, couldn't be i couldn't be more happy to be on this 
panel with you guys and thank you for your time. Um, and I and I think Julia, would you care to take us out? Yeah, thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you, panelists. I really appreciate all of you taking the time to be here. Attendees, thank you so much. Um, we wish we could have you with us here in the Valley, but I hope we brought a little bit of the Valley to you and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I dropped in the chat, or I will drop in the chat right now, um, some resources, again, information about the auction for trade, uh, the link to register to bid if you haven't already done so. Our auction will be online next week from August 11th to 13th with a live close the afternoon of the 13th. We hope to see you all there and uh, thank you. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Salute. Cheers, y'all.